the time has come for my people to go. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's what the people demand, and we're gonna keep fighting till we get that land. I'm not a queen, I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a king, I'm a servant of the people. It's time to rise and get what we want, we got to organize. Welcome to the Pantsula Podcast, brought to you by the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, my name's Evan. It's my comrade Jamila. Uh, we're representing the Kaji Work Study Circle. Our goal is Pan Africanism, and we define Pan Africanism as the total unification and liberation of the African continent under scientific socialism. So, our the topic today is on policing African women. And before we get into that topic, we want to we all as we always do honor a couple of our ancestors. And for this episode, we're honoring Elma Francois and Betty Shabazz. Elma Francois, she's dope. She was a labor organizer. She was a communist. She helped to facilitate what people think about now when. Um, you have unions going at the docks and preventing uh, Israeli cargo from coming through. She participated in that, but just put the word Italian cargo. So yeah. she was dope and she needs to be honored and more people need to know about her story. She formed the National Unemployed Movement or the NUM. It was later known as the Negro Welfare Cultural and Social Association or the NWSA. And it was a multi-gendered organization. She also did a lot of work in making sure women were represented in the labor movement. There's a lot of folks, Trinis better step up. There's a lot of revolutionaries that are Trinis. Oh, yes. And she was one of them. So mm-hmm. let's honor Elma Francois. And we got Betty Shabazz. What's up, Evan? We'll talk about Betty Shabazz. Yes. And... And, it's going to, and this is going to tie into a bit of what we're talking about with the uh, police African women is uh, Betty Shabazz. And the first thing people think, oh, it's, oh it's, uh, the widow of uh, Malcolm X, uh, El Hashmi Lake El Shabazz. But as, but as we're going to talk about that, she's one, one, known for way more than that, doing uh, liberation work like for, for decades after until her untimely, untimely uh, transition. I remember... Growing up in Brooklyn, I used to always walk past the Medgar Evers College, and I was like, Betty mm-hmm. Shabazz is probably teaching in there right now. I always <laughs> used to think that. I was like, eh, Betty Shabazz is probably in there in that moment, and I want to walk in and say hi, and I never got to. But mm-hmm. those sisters need to be honored every day, and we speak their names, and the work that we do is on their shoulders. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much to all the sisters who are doing this work. And as Evan said, this episode is in relation to policing African women. There's a historical basis for doing this episode and we're still seeing it to this day. And one of the things in terms of popular culture that happened to uh, instances where we have Monique, who's the comedian and she's talking about her body being policed through the Netflix boycott. She wanted everybody to boycott Netflix because she didn't receive as much money as Euro comedians or male comedians. So the fact that she's sitting up there on camera and in a robe, in a gray robe and saying, if you want to be treated as queens, you need to look like a queen. It's like you're in a bathrobe (laughs) and there's nothing wrong with being in a bathrobe. So you should know there's nothing wrong with someone wearing a bonnet in an airport. You don't know what someone's going through. People drop off their kids at the bus stop in bonnets. People go to the store in the bonnets. Maybe they're in the middle of a hairstyle. We don't know. Maybe somebody just feels like wearing a bonnet. It's okay. We have to stop policing what women do anyway, but particularly African women we are discussing the other situation. We're of course going to get into the more political and social and economic factors for this during the show. But another thing that recently happened was another comedian, Godfrey 
So he goes to bed do or die, right? <laughs> <laughs> and bed is heavily gentrified right now. So localized colonialism. He yeah. goes in and says, yeah, bed is black and we're seeing all these ads everywhere with these white men and these black women, what's going on? We started that first. Where's all the ads with the black men and the white women? So he's not even complaining about the issue of there being interracial relationships. He's complaining about the lack of access that he as an African man has to these advertisements. Yes, there's definitely an agenda to be had. There's always an agenda under capitalism. Mm -hmm. So what's the latest thing to sell? Interracial relationships, just like LGBTQ plus movements were to be sold. We're, we're now in late stage capitalism where everything is commodified. So for Godfrey to not understand that, uh, understand that these relationships, whether they're based on a power structure in those relationships or love or whatever, he also needs to understand that in late stage capitalism, everything is commodified. So what makes him think that this is not an agenda of commodification. So right. it, he's complaining that he doesn't have access to it. That's just as problematic. And that does go <laughs> into policing African women's bodies because you're saying that you can't be with who you love. I know there's a whole movement about, you know, moving away from Blackistan or whatever. It's not even what this is about. Love is love. <laughs> right. But we have to understand that everything under late stage capitalism in particular is commodified. And for him to not have that understanding and that political analysis is problematic because his argument against these ads is once again saying, why don't we as African men have access to that? What are your thoughts of it? Yeah, I, I, I kind of find that weird because like, like uh, I, I've seen because well, I've seen plenty of ads where it's where it's an African man and, and a European woman. So I, I'm because I'm really confused about what, what, what that's all about, and 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 it, and, it, and going to your point about like the, the way it come up about that everything is an, another thing that aside from like interracial uh, uh, coupling or relationships as well as LGBTQ plus uh, really, another thing is of. Uh, uh, of body acceptance, that's another thing that's being commodified. And um, especially uh, like sort of uh, you have companies that are embracing you know, like full figure women or 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 women who who have or have disabilities or are disabled or stuff like that. And and as far as African women, they, they, in in a way there is there's also this uh, a sort of need for like, instead of presenting, oh I I can't see myself. And these advertisers like, oh, I see myself, but I have to, like, oh, I have, I have to look like this. I have to look, I got to be like thick, <laughs> you know, the, like, like that becomes uh, uh, a point is like a point of pride. And then, and then, and again, we talk about uh, the di dialectic of, on the one hand, understanding that, yeah, like people have different bodies, like obviously. And this, and this, uh, and noting that, that we shouldn't, there shouldn't be a, uh, disrespect or expectation based on the fact that you don't have like this specific by type um, is is a is a is a bit of progress at the same time it also presents uh another bit of 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 a of a point where you, people have to feel that they have to look a certain way in order to like like be accepted into the capitalist patriarchal system that like if you, and and also, and we'll talk a little bit more about this as well. The sort of the, the duality of, uh, of African women, especially of of either being sought as of without a sexuality, or on the flip side, being seen, seen as hypersexual, and and how that gets used not only in like popular culture, but just in general, as far as how that plays out in within, within relationships within the greater. Uh, culture. Absolutely. I want to get into what you were talking about in relation to the word queen as well, because when you think of queen, there are particular bodies that fit into this notion of what that means. When people talk about queen and people say to me, oh, hey, queen, whatever, I say, I don't want to return to feudalism. 
And I also say, I'd rather be a servant of the people. Hence the song, the theme song of this podcast. I'd rather be a servant of the people than a queen with subjects. We have to have this whole idea about having individual leaders. We need to eliminate that idea, that concept, and we need to work together the masses to have our liberation. So when Monique or anyone else is talking about you need to act like a queen, there's still the social hierarchy. So someone wearing a bonnet, someone wearing a stocking cap, uh, people aren't even talking about do rags. You know, maybe Monique would say, "Oh, it's not my place to talk about that because men wear do rags." It's who's to say only men wear do rags? Who's to say only women wear bonnets? In policing of who can wear what and when is still this notion of going to these class lines and returning to feudalism. So you're a queen, or we were all kings and queens, or we were this, that, or the other, literally makes no sense because who built the pyramids? Who tends to the fields? Who actually works to produce the resources that end up being purchased? It's definitely not kings and queens. So when someone says, Need to act like a king and queen, there are particular bodies, once again, that fit into that. And uh, once you get into Sarah Bartman, in, in that case, you know, you're going to segue into the story of Sarah Bartman. And I'm sure those who are listening or watching uh, have heard of Sarah Bartman or Sarchi Bartman or Hot and Top Venus, which ultimately is derogatory. So I, I would like to know her coy name. I don't, I don't sadly know that, but I will go by Sarah Bartman. So she did her best to have body autonomy. And so she did agree on some level, okay, you know, I'll go and do this. We need to make some money. But she was stolen. She is eventually was sold to an animal trainer and put under slavery in France. And then her body was put on display and she was, as you were talking about, hypersexualized. And they wanted to see, oh, well, other people from her tribe had um, enlarged labias and stuff like that. So we're gonna see if she does. And so she did her best to keep her dignity and she kept a cloth over her genitals. And they did so much to pick her apart. And eventually they really literally did pick her apart and chopped her up and her body was not returned to her people. And they kept her in museums. And you wanna talk about, again, policing African bodies, uh, keeping bones of comrades in the MOVE organization in museums. You know, that's recently happening. So this story has, been set in stone, if you will, for Africans for centuries. Her body was here and there and this and that in museum to be examined and be like, well, you know, African people medically, they don't feel as much pain. Or, and you know, so she's on display because of her enlarged body parts. And uh, she was made to look like a non-human and treated as such. And her body was police. She no longer had autonomy over her body. So the most she could do in terms of that autonomy is say, I don't want you to look here. I'm gonna continue to wear a cloth. But what ended up happening, she was assaulted. Um, it was said in the autopsy that again, she possibly had syphilis. Um, so, the types of things they did to her, I can't even imagine. The, the way they chopped up her body and distributed her so people can research her and her people. The way she was put on display. It's like, I don't know if you've seen the movie Freaks, but it's very much like that where people- Yeah, had, I've seen that. Yeah, so Todd Browning, people who had uh, 
different conditions, um, different levels of ability, um, they were put on display in a circus and she was treated in the same exact way. And with that, her people were also put on display. Her people were dissected. And to this day, I mean, there was a movie that came out in France about her life. I saw bits of it. it was what I saw was terrible. Her story is never going to come out if the colonizers continue to tell that story. And the way her body, again, was picked apart, the way her body was policed, and that's not even the best word, but I, I think it is the best word in relation to colonialism. So I'm going to continue to use it in that way because it really is about colonialism of the body, not just a, a physical land space, but a physical body space where we're being told how to identify. We're being told how our body should look in accordance to societal standards. And she didn't fit those societal standards. She was being compared to European women. And so European women then and now are still the societal standard. Yes, some of uh, our body parts as African women are being picked apart and people are surgically um, getting those pieces, but that's a whole other conversation. I'm not even saying people shouldn't do that. What I'm saying is that these body parts are being celebrated, but the beings who do have those body parts are not. This is what happened with Sarah Bartman. Her, she wasn't even celebrated. She was ogled. And this is a history, a, a, again, with the medical field, with the entertainment field. And it's, it's just, policing is the only word that I could have for this. Because once people are policed, you no longer have autonomy over who you are as a person. Over-policing happens in African communities all the time. And you are not allowed to have autonomy. You are not allowed to make decisions as a community because you can't even walk outside of that community and say, oh, I can go into this. Oh, no, no, no. what are you doing in this neighborhood? You have no autonomy as an African person in the West. And to think that th this, to think that her body was celebrated because you had European photographers, uh, like was it Jean-Paul Gaud or Gaud or however you pronounce his name. So I'm gonna actually say a quote from him. Uh, if anybody knows who that guy is, he uh, had a relationship with Grace Jones. And there was a really famous photo where she was totally nude and one leg was up and uh, you know that cover. <laughs> and, um, so Kim Kardashian ended up doing a similar image and I think it was uh, photographed by Jean-Paul Gaud as well. And this was in 2014, the paper magazine. And so I don't know if everyone who critiqued the image knew of the Grace Jones image. Some people did. But I think people were right to look at it as, a, quote, the exploitation of fetishism of the Black female body. Because again, a lot of people uh, looked at Kim Kardashian as the standard at the time. You know, that, that family did a lot of work on their bodies, but they were looked at to be the standards. And yet the bodies they were constructing were inspired by African women who were left out and were not able to have autonomy. So all of these European women or women on some level of European descent or who of mixed ethnicity or what they call racially ambiguous or whatever, were in music video after music video after you had an era of Buffy the Bodies, et cetera. It's like, okay, we move over and we'll have racially ambiguous women. Again, this is not 
saying, oh, racial and bigotry, this, this, this is not a complaint about the women themselves. This is about the system which creates this hierarchy that says these racially ambiguous women and European women are more socially acceptable. That is the issue. And the bodies of African women on these racially ambiguous or European women is even more acceptable. And uh, Jean-Paul Gaud, so he, there was a book they did, uh, Carolina Beaumont, uh, that was the work. Um, and he had a, a book called Jungle Fever. And so he acknowledges, he says, quote, Blacks are the premise of my work. So he is picking apart the African body, looking at it artistically and saying, okay, you're the premise of my work. Mm. Objectifying the African bodies and yet it's being commodified once again in these photos of Kim Kardashian, et cetera. Yeah. So that's where you see that hierarchy. So it's not the women themselves, it's the system that allows this to happen or uh, assures that there's a profit motive to be made by this hierarchy, I should say. <laughs> and again, as, as you were talking about that, there is like, it, like the relationship to colonialism that that is seen, that we see uh, African women as as these pro products that, that have to be policed. And it goes not only, and we talk about the medical field, like. Especially now, when we talk in this talk discussion about oh, there's vaccine reluctance or or reluctant, and and like the and a lot of this gets uh, put on on Africans and and then and it, and even when they do acknowledge when it is acknowledgement of like medical racism and like, the use of use of use of African bodies for for research for like, to try on certain. Like certain products, or like, uh, I don't know. If a good example is uh, if you if you live up in, in New York, especially in my hood by um, Central Park, there for a long time there was a statue of Dr. Uh, uh, J. Marion Sims, who was one of one founders of uh, gynecology, and for a long time, and it was years, oh, years of of protesting and petitioning and so on to get that statue done because. His work relied on the exploitation and the di dissection of of enslaved African women. So, <laughs> and as a large person, like, oh, we got we got to keep it because he's important, and and because like the because the um, I think the uh, like the National Medical Center or something is like right by is right by there. So that was probably one reason why uh, they had uh, Doctor Sims as a uh, statue there. But again, again, it gets like that. We the, there is something that we have to be. That we looked at as a physique that I've looked at as, and then it's just, we can use whatever we want. And then, as I think, there's another point as far as not only about the the police, uh, policing of women of of what they look like, of either appreciation or deprecation of their looks, but also of as in regards to the production, like children and. And either seeing seeing uh, African women as oh like you, like you hear from like you hear about these series of like the welfare queen or you have the women of talk about oh uh, or you hear like you get all the drama from let's say Maury or or uh, these shows or and 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 even and even get into like go for a point for the medical field that as far as rights of women that like in, in in popular in popular news media, you, you you often hear about uh, the battle over abortion. Of uh, one thing that's not talked about as much is how of women of African women, especially especially and, and, and just cause women generally, but African women particularly, and sterilization for a long time. For if we know one of our ancestors, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, she was unknowingly uh, sterilized. It's called a well, called Mississippi appendectomy. It would basically be like she, like she was, you know, have children if she wanted to, and because there's always this fear of if there are more of them or more Africans produced, then that means more of them organized, more and 
there's always this fear and and then it gets into the battle of uh, to the extent of whether African women should have birth control or what should be done if they do have children and then like and it gets blamed on all that oh they don't have culture they they do have this like they're just begging the state to take care of the children or they're doing all this stuff and and it just gets and it sort of like puts the effects of poverty the effects of exploitation as the cause and and that's another problem right there And speaking of that dude, uh, J. Marion Sims, so he actually was a supporter of the Confederacy. That's one thing people don't talk about <laughs> when talking about the father of gynecology. But he, he also talks about a lot of stuff happening before anesthesia. But anesthesia uh, began in 1846. That was the, the year of the first successful anesthesia, but the African women, of course, did not receive anesthesia. And with that, you know, talking about medical apartheid, uh, medical racism, uh, African people in general are thought to have less pain. So they're not uh, asked if they are in pain. They're not asked if they need more meds. They're, there's little follow-up on a lot of what African people are going through. So this is what he writes, says uh, Lucy, Anarcha, and Betsy, unlike Anarcha, so, but um, this, besides these three cases, I got three or four more to experiment on. And there was never a time that I could not at any day have had a subject for operation, but my operations all failed so far as a positive cure was concerned. This went on not for one year, but for two and three and even four years. I kept all these Negroes at my own expense all the time. So what he did to these African women was unsterilized and he used a slightly bent spoon. Uh, um, what is now known as the speculum or what's known as the sim speculum came out of that. Uh, you know, a lot of, you think of uh, that guy that got stuck in the mountain and he cut his arm off or whatever, you know, obviously he had to use whatever means in order to get out of that situation. But this was a doctor. This was a doctor who was able to use clean tools at the time, even if it's boiling hot water or whatever, but did not use it on African women. And he said, Again, I kept all these Negroes at my own expense all the time. And so therein lies the contradiction. Contradictions happen all the time. It is important for people to have gynecological care, to do yearly checkups, six months checkups, et cetera. But it's important to understand the history of gynecology. You can know the history and not avoid it because obviously there have um, been laws put into place to not do things like that, but they're still during the trainings. And this, there's been recent research about this, that African people are still seen as having less pain. Um, they, there is even in uh, some of these trainings uh, about uh, Mexican people uh, having more pain and you know, it's, or I, I think there's more pain. Um, like there's certain ideas that people have about a particular uh, ethnic or national or racial groups, if you will, that this goes into how people take care of patients. And I did want to talk about my experience for a second. We're gonna talk about capitalism and disability. There's gonna be a whole episode around that. But I do want to talk about my experience for a moment in the hospital. 
I was talking to my cousin about this because I, I thought about this almost daily. Why is it that I was asked all the time, are you okay? Do you need more meds? It was, the care was excellent. And I thought about that thing like, Africans are usually seen as having less pain. And, and you know, if, uh, uh, I've, I've actually experienced that in my own life because I've had a uh, cyst in my ovaries. And I went to a doctor when I was tw um, either like late teens, or early 20s. And that particular day, I didn't have the pains, but I would have these dull pains off and on, ended up that I had ovarian cysts. But this particular doctor, said to me, oh, do you have the pains now? And I said, no, he said, oh, you're okay. And then it ended up where I could not go to the bathroom. I couldn't sit up, it hurt so much. So I took myself on that train and went to the emergency room. Ended up finding out again, I had ovarian cysts. I actually went to this particular doctor because I had a lump under my arm. I was like, oh, a cancer scare. Ended up being lymph nodes, which swollen lymph nodes could also be an issue but he was like, well, swollen lymph nodes, you'll be all right, get out of here. And that doctor was African. So there is a truth to this idea in the medical industry that Africans are expendable and folks who are working class are expendable, especially if you don't have insurance. So I just every day sitting in the hospital with my legs damaged, like, why are they taking so good care of me? What's going on? My cousin said, because you had support. You had people checking in on you every day. You had people calling the hospital checking in on you. You had insurance. So there were particular circumstances in which I was privileged enough to not have negligent care. And I feel very, very fortunate that I have that support where people were checking in on me and visiting me, et cetera. I know not everyone has that. And I wonder if they received ne negligent treatment. The hospital that I went to was one of the top hospitals for uh, trauma. So I don't know if that would necessarily be the case because I was in a room with a lot of other patients. I had neighbors and they were also asked, do you need care, whatever? So I don't know if that's the case, but I know that it is common because people talk all the time about negligent care from hospitals. But I'm just saying, particularly as an anti-capitalist, I sat there almost every day of my life in that hospital and wondered why I was getting sufficient care and I think my cousin's absolutely right. You had a support network of people checking in on you. And I, I said, oh, wow. So I, I don't know, have you, I know we're talking about policing women, but just as African folks right now, just talking, have you had negligent, had negligent, negligent care or people assuming you were in less pain uh, when you went to the hospital or emergency room or just a doctor's visit? Uh I I I don't recall like any uh, circumstances. I do, I do remember having. Like, I think it's less like in any cases where it's been the case. It's more. It's a lot more been um, on the mental mental health rather than physical. Uh, is it like there are times where it felt like, oh, uh, like you just have to do. You just have to do this, this, and this. Oh, you just have to take your meds and like, okay, I'm taking my meds. Okay, I'm doing this. Okay, and then, and you're like, okay, and like things are getting better, and then you just and you just get this uh, like cycle of, oh, why can't why why can't I do this? Like, uh, I, as far as like physically, I I see sadly not more with my uh, with my mother that, and especially like when when she was uh in a nursing home recently that she like she she had this like. I think it seemed like the opposite of problem because I was, I was busy. I, I had like work, I had school classes, I was doing organized work. So I didn't have as much time to keep in track with her. And, and from everything she's told me about what they've been doing is it's just like, 
uh, like, yeah, they, they say like they didn't like they didn't uh, do and then like uh, get like the dressing off as often as they should have, or they didn't get like oh like oh we'll talk to the doctor about see you about this, and then you don't hear, then you don't hear from them, and uh, it's just uh, and 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 even and as you talk about the case of the the doctor that. I was like, uh, they uh, said like you were fine. I, I, there have been moments where uh, even I like when I'm with my mom, when I'm with her, where I even like she says she's in pain, and then I'm just sort of like, uh, she just just, just muscle through it. It's like so, so you see that it that it, it even if that even when Africans themselves like we we still have the idea that oh we're strong, oh we can talk get through this, we can do that, and then and yeah, it's just uh. Yeah, it's just, mm. yeah, absolutely. It's like y'all been through slavery, y'all can deal with it. Y'all, be, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of medical racism, as mentioned. Um, there's definitely the huge case of Henrietta Lacks, who was given mass doses of radiation. Um, before I get into that, there's also the thalidomide babies. So, I mean, that's, you want to talk about (laughs) medical negligence. Uh, I know that predominantly happened to Europeans and, uh, but it happened uh, under the Nazis. And then a lot of that shipped over and says, oh, well, you're having morning sickness. Oh, you can deal with it with this toxic medicine. And because, you know, we experimented on rats, um, they didn't die. So we can give it to y'all, even though they didn't do Mm -hmm enough tests on this to see the levels of toxicity. So people ended up feeling sick, but they said, oh, you know, it's okay. And then children came out with either short or no arms or legs, breathing mm-hmm. problems, heart problems, uh, mental issues, and uh, just the stories of people uh, who are still living, who were thalidomide babies is just, it's heartbreaking it's not just Africans who are being affected by the medical industry. I just wanted to say that, which just shows as, you know, Michael Jackson said, they don't care about us. Other people said that too, but, (laughs) but, uh, but this idea that because we've been through so much as African people were able to withstand particular types of pain, I'm doubled over in pain with ovarian cysts. And the doctor says, Oh, you're going to be all right. Or, um, there's extra levels of blood when someone is in childbirth and the doctors are like, no, you could go through it. And the person who is giving birth ends up not even being able to see their child in the end. Ugh. So this happens a lot. And I know in California, they started to uh, create these methods to see if there are any issues with someone giving birth. So they'll have a scale, they'll take the amount of blood lost uh, at that point and they'll weigh the blood to see if it's the normal amount of blood versus uh, an abnormal amount of blood. So those are things that are happening in terms of um, working to alleviate medical racism in terms of uh, childbirth. Um, but Henrietta Lacks, uh, that, <sighs> So that is another story in which African women's bodies uh, were commodified, policed in a way, and then Euros took credit for it. And uh, so John Hopkins, so I'm actually going to read this from the John, John Hopkins, uh, org site. And I'm reading this for a reason. In 1951, a young mother of five named Henrietta Lacks visit the John Hopkins Hospital complaining of vaginal bleeding. So uh, upon examination, renowned gynecologist, Dr. Howard Jones discovered a large malignant tumor on her cervix. At the time, the John Hopkins Hospital was only one of a few hospitals to treat poor Africans. It says African-Americans, but I'm not saying that. I guess I just did. (laughs) As medical records show, Ms. Lacks began undergoing radium treatments for her cervical cancer. This was the best medical treatment available at the time for this terrible disease. A sample of her cancer cells retrieved during a biopsy were sent to Dr. George Gay's nearby tissue lab. 
For years, Dr. Gay, a prominent cancer and virus researcher, had been collecting cells from all patients who came to the John Hopkins Hospital with cervical cancer, but each sample quickly died in Dr. Gay's lab. What he would soon discover was that Dr. Miss, Mrs. Lack's cells were unlike any of the others he had ever seen. Whereas other cells would die, Ms. Lack's cells doubled every 20 to 24 hours. Today's these incredible cells, nicknamed Gila cells, from the first two letters of her first and last names, are used to study the effects of toxins, drugs, hormones, and viruses on the growth of cancer cells without experimenting on humans. But they experimented on her. They had been used to test the effects of radiation and poisons to study the human genome, to learn how, more about how viruses worked and play a crucial role in the development of the polio vaccine. Although Mrs. Lax ultimately passed away on October 4th, 1951 at the age of 31, her cells continued to impact the world. So they didn't talk about how uh, they did this without her consent at all. Not anywhere on this page do they mention that her cells were taken without her consent or her family's consent. So again, our bodies are policed. The means or the resources have been taken from us without our consent. And then John Hopkins or whoever takes credit for this. Yeah, they kind of sort of gave her credit for it if you want to go there. But it, it, they're essentially saying, yeah, she was sick uh, herself. Thanks. Thanks, Henrietta Lacks. And again, the missing piece to this is that they experimented on her and her cells were stolen in order to do this. So I know that a lot of countries at this point uh, are starting to acknowledge, yes, we stole resources. Um, you know, India is still trying to get the jewels back from the queen. You know, all of this is happening. Uh, you know, Germany has apologized for what happened in Namibia. Um, you know, Macron is, a, you know, they're, He's apologizing. I know there was that smack by that right winger guy, whatever. <laughs> but uh, uh, people with different political ideologies were like, "Yeah, the smack." But <laughs> but yeah, our cells are stolen, our body parts are chopped up, and then we're still policed on what we need to do. And we are being told every day that we need to perform respectability politics in order to even be seen as a full human. And it is particularly women whose bodies are policed in this day and age, whether it's our cells, whether again, it's uh, genitals, whether it's um, being looked at so people can have surgical, whatever it is, our bodies are objectified, our bodies are policed. And even to go with the, like just like, not only the policing of of women of African women's bodies and and parts of, but it, even like we it was also to talk about of of the effects of like policing as like like actual like like cops <laughs> um, that that there's that there's also uh, there's policing there that that as far as uh, even even like, I know there's like in we see this discussion about oh about the victims of police murder that of oh, not not paying attention to African women who were also killed and under, and understandably that there are there are African women who are who've been murdered and assassinated by police um they definitely and definitely want to fight for them and even then and it and then there's also also that uh, police also do they like, take advantage of of Africans, like uh, physically, not not only like killing them, but also uh, committing sexual assault and raping them. And uh, remember uh, a while ago the Daniel Holsclaw case of 
him like focusing solely on African women, and like this, and it's a constant thing that it, that there is uh, the police use their position of power as as like shock troops of the of the of the white of the white capitalist cap, patriarchal uh, system to uh, look at African women as as much as uh, targets as 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 men as African women as, and also. And and it goes also as far as um, uh, in states of war that uh, I mean, we could go on about the like the immense amount of like sexual assault, of rape, and murder of women in more time like in more time basically women and children, especially get even though like obviously like of men do like uh, die in her main during war that it takes a a big, a giant toll on on African women and children, and and we can talk and and one part and another part that gets ignored not only as far as like oh it's just not only just about like, getting shot or bombed or like assaulted but sanctions are another part that if the sanctions against uh, these like enemy nations all those sanctions in particular affect women. Affect their ability to work, their ability to so to make a living. That it, it takes a toll on them because it affects the healthcare system, it affects infrastructure, it affects you know, all these like, all those bits that are necessary for for the for uh, collectives to operate. And when that when it happens, then it leads to um, uh, just giant disasters. And to your point. I'm thinking of Sandra Bland. A lot of people blamed her for her murder. Why didn't she shut up? She needs to just cooperate with the police. When men all the time go, well, what did I do? What did I, particularly Euro men, oh, I'm a sovereign citizen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't see instances I have yet to see, and I do watch some of those because I want to see what's going to happen. But there was one time a guy got pulled out of his car, but that's the worst of it. You know, they broke the glass in his truck or car and then they pulled him out. But you never see, you never see murders of these European men, sovereign citizen, that someone who was standing up for herself Yes, there, there were certain uh, ideological disagreements that we would have with her, but as, as we've said on other episodes, that's something that we would struggle with, with them over. Um, Africans who question do not deserve death by the state. We as communities need to struggle over these issues with other Africans in our organizing. And that, that ability to do that was taken away by the state. And for people who practice misogyny more to question the fact that she stood up for herself, the fact that someone even has to say, well, she should have shut her mouth. The fact that someone has to police what she does, yet men do the same thing and they are celebrated all of the time. The fact that we, uh, you, you talked about assaults, you talked about, again, literal policing by the police, the over-policing of our bodies. The fact that we can understand when this happens to men but we cannot understand when this happens to women. This goes deep into misogyny noir. And I also want to get into uh, popular culture once again, because it is interconnected. Everything is political and guarantee that these acronymed organizations are sitting on these boards and making sure there is an agenda to profit off of African death, to profit off of African right. exploitation right. of 
African women and non-men's bodies. So when you have T.I. <laughs> going on his podcast and saying it is his right as a husband to assault and rape his wife. He says this on a podcast. <laughs> she said, well, you know, sometimes I don't feel like doing nothing, you know, like, and he's like, well, it's your duty as my wife to give it to me when I want. <laughs> I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but he said that on his podcast. You have people like Charlemagne. Mm. You have pe people like uh, Umar Johnson uh, policing women's bodies. And Charlemagne goes on the internet. All these gurus is like, right like, like gurus is like oh you got you gotta do this you gotta do that you gotta wait you gotta exactly. wait you gotta wait this time you gotta look like this right so or or uh what's the what's the guy kevin samuels mm. uh so it's like who are you you're you're averaged at best who are you to think that you can get a high value man that's literally policing a, <laughs> a woman's body. That's literally policing of a, a, a woman's agency over what she does. Right. Who are you to say what she can and cannot do? So all of these men, Tariq and Ashid, all of them, you're like, oh, I'm a pimp, I'm this, I'm that. And uh, this is what you need to do as women. Are you kidding me? So you have T.I., you have 50 cent, you have all these people who are looked at as heroes to some people. Right. Yeah. On some level. And they're performing misogynoir. They're letting you know where they stand and they are still being celebrated. They're still being lauded as real men, whatever that means. <laughs> and getting back to Charlemagne. He posted on social media making jokes about the R. Kelly tape and saying like that. It's, it's, it's 2021, we should, just come on. Right. So, you know, and, and so you have Jessica Reed, the sister who was assaulted by him. And so she's being attacked left and right. So guarantee that there is an agenda under capitalism to make sure that African women and non-men's pain is perpetuated through these channels via social media, via radio, via other means of popular culture. This is not coming out of nowhere. If there was no profit motive behind it, guarantee there would be a stop put to it. But of course, it's like, oh, it's like people are talking about the commodification of black death right now. Oh, we're talking about the com commodification of the policing of African women and non-men's bodies. It goes into the same school. It's just a different branch under the same tree. It's all capitalism. But to say that it is okay for you as a husband to be able to assault your wife, what does that even sound like? <laughs> and people are okay with that and people laugh at that and think it's a joke. And this is the same man who said, you know, getting back to Sims, this is the same man who said that he went with his daughter to see if she was still a virgin. Again, policing women's and non-men's bodies. Exactly. That is exactly what that is. It doesn't stop with, with the police. It doesn't stop with... Uh, outside of popular culture or entertainment or whatever everything is political so we best look at everything in that light we cannot take that for granted we have to look at all that seriously when people say things like that whether it, even if it's a joke i don't think it is but even if it is why would somebody make a joke like that and also this idea with dave Chappelle, another comedian so we're talking about the alphabet mafia and you know, it's just again policing how people express themselves policing how people identify themselves like people do not under this type of comedy um you're saying through that type of comedy that that
people are not able to have full autonomy over their identities. People can be like, yeah, it's just a joke or whatever. But ultimately what it's saying is that there is a social hierarchy. And if you are in the alphabet mafia, you are towards the bottom of that hierarchy, which means you are not allowed to have full autonomy as a human being, as a sentient being. That is what I am getting from that type of comedy. I don't know what you're getting out of it, Evan, but that's what I'm uh, getting out of it. I, I, uh, I know the problem. Like, I know, I know, like the comedians get like, oh, all oh, this, all this wokeness is getting us. All oh, the wokeness killing comedy. Uh, like, I, I still manage to laugh at some point. Like, I, I, I and just because he, just because he can't make, can't make jokes, uh, can't like adjust jokes or whatever to his hand doesn't mean I mean comedy's dead. Like. And, and like I still, and like I can't, on occasion, I still look at some older stuff, and I guess yeah, like some of it might be a little like shaky, but at the same time, it's not like I can't laugh at some things. But, and but like certain comedians, like certain comedians are able to like, like understand like deny dynamics and power dynamics and like make fun of that and do it effectively. So, and also, and one thing, one point I want to say is about like going back to the point about Sandra Bland is. Like about uh, like why is why did she talk back? Why was she having that attitude? Or uh, and, uh, and one thing another thing that brought me um, brought in mind is that uh, she was pretty tall too. So again, that's like you know, at least that uh, like going back to the whole like uh, like the sexless type of sexuality uh, duality that like there's like because she was a a, lar- a larger woman that. A taller woman that therefore that like there's some extra aggressiveness added onto onto her words as and and you see it and especially if you see that and like when you talk about athletes and like African female athletes and if they're too like they like to get uh this sort of like aggressiveness and like masculinity attached to them, you know, like the Williams sisters or you see with uh it, even it, even with Simone Biles is like four four foot not eight. He still he still see like a lot like why does she carry herself like that or like Gabrielle Douglas? Why does she carry like that or or you see like you see like all the stereotypes. Um, and again, it's just this um, it's like general policing that they have to look a, be a certain way in order to be accepted. And and it, it's 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 just disgusting. And and also the point of regards to. Uh, like the sort of like the pimp, the pimp and the sex worker um, dynamic is that like I like think about how often like pimp, like pimps and pimp culture and pimp, like, they all, like think like how often that gets uh, either like either self if even not celebrate but at least like uh, reflect as copy of something that if maybe not something that people exactly go for but certainly it's like something that's like oh like, oh like, oh yeah he's pimping oh yeah like yeah like, he's like pimp and like cool and but if you're but if you're sex but if you're doing sex work you know, then that then you just get like you just get destroyed and 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 it's also the one of I didn't yeah you know you have the, the sex worker who gets uh looked down upon but also like if, if people like if you have uh, antennas who say, "Yeah, I, I I strip or I I did sex work, I did cam work, I did this," and then you get and the negative of uh, these, of course, there's also the idea of the commodification of sexuality, and, and that's another different, that's another topic. But again, uh, you get like somehow if, if you were doing if an African woman has done or is doing some kind of uh, sexual sexual work that's, that's sort of uh, uh, frowned upon. Like if you, even if someone did it like because like with the conditions that they, they had no other choice to do so, like like poverty and they had no other choice to do so, even then it gets like it's like a marker on them that, oh, you did this, I don't want I don't want to touch you, I don't take you seriously. You just see this is actually by our comrade Onyesamu. And this is from the Hood Communists. So the piece is called African Women Don't Be a Mammy for Empire. And police and women's body, again, they have done it through Kamala Harris or Kamala or 
Kamala Top Cop Harris, whatever name you want to call her, but is this the hot new trend in the US empire is pushing African women to the front in order to make us the faces of the same old capitalist imperialist violence. We are positioned as woke ladies with agency, kicking ass and taking names, bringing big auntie energy and those good, good outfits to the day to the work of making managing a genocidal settler colonial empire. We don't have to look any further than the examples of current US ambassador to the UN and former high ranking State Department official in Africa, Linda Thomas Greenfield. I uh, actually said a quote from her in the other episode where she was just like, go Israel. <sighs> or current domestic policies are and co architect of the invasion and devastation of Libya, Susan Rice. There's also Stacey Abrams, Condoleezza Rice, and dozens of others who have made mewling a trend. All too often these days, we are witnessing petit bourgeois African women willingly take positions of leadership, power, and influence within the political and military infrastructure of the US. Positions that require, as part of their job descriptions, acts of extreme ongoing violence against the world's most oppressed populations, including their own people. And I wanted to open that with a question to you, Evan, in regards to what's happening to uh, one of the squad right now. And uh, so there's the critique of what's happening uh, on the basis of US imperialism and the African sister is part of the squad. She's saying, well, it's with the ICC court, shouldn't Israel and the US uh, be critiqued as well as Hamas and the Taliban. And they were like, yo, do not compare the Taliban and Hamas to Israel and the US. And she's being attacked right now and she's gotten death threats and you know all these things are happening. So I think this is definitely relative uh, where She's gonna go back and toe the line. Get, uh, uh, b- believe you me, she's gonna go back and do that. I don't think she already did. Oh, see, I oh, I I'm late on that one. Yeah, I think mean, she said something about uh, El El Han Omar. To, to, she already towed the line, huh? Okay. Yeah, like oh, I think it was like something about like uh, trying to compare like these terrorist groups to democratic governments. <laughs> oh, she that's right. She did say that. Yeah. But even again, we had this conversation, even with Hamas, Hamas was democratically elected. So Hamas, I mean, yes, like the US does, Israel, they created a situation where you were able to radicalize a group of people. And because you're in a state of oppression, it's like, we will vote these people in because we need representation. So without that nuance and to just say Hamas, it's like, uh, and like anything else that's happening, which is similar to what's happening in China, like radicalizing a few people and then saying, okay, now we have an enemy. That happened in Afghanistan. That happened just all over the world that's being invaded. You had a series of people who were being radicalized. You don't think that happened in Palestine? It's like, give, come on. So to even not have that nuance and to just be like Hamas, Taliban, U.S. like that doesn't even make sense to me. But of course, to me, that's towing the line even with that because it didn't have nuance. So, of course, yes, I that she did say that. I remember that now because um, she says no, 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 Democrat. Yes, you're right. You're absolutely right. I forgot. So yeah, um, but a lot of people are praising her. But still, no matter how much you tow the line, what happened? She got policed. Yeah. So what's the point of being an African towing the line and you still gonna get threats? What's the point of it? <laughs> and, and, and I remember this happening uh, before when hey, she got uh, she got criti- criticized for these sort of like the uh, hey, she did the whole like, like to talk about the Israelite Think the Israel lobby and the, the all about the Benjamins comment and 
like, I mean, like, and as and I also remember like earlier, like when she was uh, questioning Elliot Abrams, talked about uh, about like like about. Are, 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 like, do you remember when you did this in uh, El Salvador? You did this before in Venezuela in 02, or this, and uh, but then, but then, still sort of saying, "Oh, but you you won't do this again, right?" <laughs> so, <laughs> or like, or like, we're, but we agree that like this stuff has to change in Venezuela, like, which is like basically saying like. I make sure if you change, if you do regime change, make sure it's just a little less bloody, basically. But um, but yeah, it's it's sort of weird. like this, like even if she still a like, like still like represents the U.S. Empire, there's still there's still this hyper focus on her because like she's African, she's a Muslim, and like those together, and like she's. Science, kind of sort of left wing like it, like that combination just makes it like uh, like ripe for um like, like ripe for that uh policing even, even if in the end she still they like, work for the same empire as the the abram the elliot abrams and the dick chains and the john boltons of the world so yes and speaking of cop mala um her they had her do the dirty work in terms of immigration policy so even though it is legal under u.s law to have asylum status based on the political situation most of which was caused by u.s policy she's literally saying no you can't come here because you'll be illegal if you go through Mexico. Are you kidding me? So again, they had the 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 African woman, or you know, people want to be half Indian, half <laughs> do the work. And so it's like putting putting women up front to do this work, and then what's going to happen? She's going to be policed, but she doesn't care. You know, just just like Condoleezza didn't care, <laughs> but. It's, you know, or even Hillary Clinton. So notice how if there is a woman that is in that position, they have that woman be up front. So we came, we saw he died. Um, even uh, Hillary Clinton participating in a lot of the policies of the Clinton and the other Clinton administration. She participated in the creation of a lot of those policies and the support of a lot of those policies, like NAFTA, for instance. So women are being made to do a lot of this dirty work and continue to be attacked for doing that work and men are just in the back going oh, we're, you're making the most profits out of it and she is a person kamala harris that made the speech about her parents being immigrants and them going to university and this whole story of love and yet she's being made to do that work where you can't come here same thing that Obama did when folks from Haiti came here for asylum. No, you go back. Clinton did the same thing. So Africans and women and non-men are being made to do the dirty work of the U.S. empire. And folks who critique Africans in general um, don't see that Africans are being made to do that. They're just looking at the racial aspect, but they're not looking at the empire aspect where they're having folks who are considered to be lower on the hierarchical scale socially and politically. I mean, this is what they do with the, 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 the IDF. They have the Africans go on the front lines. So this happens to us all the time and to not make those connections, be like, oh, you know, and I'm sure the, the Africans in these governmental administrations have conversations amongst themselves. I, I'm sure they do. But they're like, well, here's another, I'm going to take some more blood money. I'll be okay with it. You know, so Kamala Harris got put up there. Well, uh, I forgot his name. Biden is that G7 making decisions on like, oh, who else uh, are we going to invade? Like, okay, Kamala, you do this. So it's the fact that 
again, Leonard Green, for all of these people, Kam- Kamala Harris, Condoleezza, being made to do that, and yet their bodies are still policed, and that connect- connection is rarely made. And I have a question sort of on that level, um, discussing you know, what people call white feminism in relation to policing African women and non-men's bodies in these particular positions. How do you see capitalist feminism or what p- some people call white feminism, how do you see this connection in terms of this policing? Well, I, I see this connection as, um, I, I see this connection, oh, it reminds me of this, uh, of this, uh, of this interview from Elaine Brown uh, of, of the Black Panther Party, t- where she talks about uh, like European uh, women and talking about we got to get out of the kitchen, and she's like, "Yeah, we gonna get- yes, we gotta get out of your kitchen because <laughs> we're because we're doing the we're doing the the, uh, the labor that allows you to want to get out and join the, the labor force with the men, with the European men, and it gives." Uh, and also, and also th- things about um, uh, this one uh, article from uh, this one, like the 1950s, 1950, the Bronx slave market, where uh, basically African women who are like uh, basically out there to use as like domestic labor for for cents on the dollars, and and uh, and just how like like there's this idea of oh when. We, or when we have commonality, how we share the same impressor, we do this and and like and which it totally ignores the role of and one book the book where we uh, patriarchy accumulation on world scale talk, talks about how like, even within even when there are some commonalities between uh, European women in the core or of, like the imperialist nations and her world of global south women. Uh, so African women uh, who are, who are facing like issues uh, exploitation in the capitalist patriarchal system that there are differences and sort of a, sort of a, sort of project a sort of project some kind of commonality without understanding some of the contradictions that face that that allow you to be in the place you are to allow yourself to get the conditions that you have. Like, even if you are uh, oppressed or exploited by the, your men, that that you and the men are are both uh, either swaying them through the best labor or they are doing extra work. Like, like if it's during enslavement, they're doing the same similar something work for uh, for the plantation, or they're doing the, the care work that of the European women either don't want to do or you like they like every woman they have this like sort of innate knowledge that they can do it or 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 right now like uh women on I mean, in plantation or like out in the fields or in factories or wherever that they they have to choose either to work for very little or or they have to like stay stay behind and do work for the family and and then like and then this like projection of like, as we talked about earlier the whole uh, idea of as far as body politics like abortion gets discussed more so than like, the sterilization which sterilization in particular has of uh, has affected uh, colonized women and and and, they, and even there there's some policing there where uh Af- for African women who Say they do they like if they're having a child and oh, they ha- they're pregnant and uh, you don't want to have and then they say oh you're trying to commit black genocide or stuff like that and and or then and then on the flip or, or it's something about uh, uh how wanting to have the state take care of you and like, of course like there is there are contradictions as far as like the role of, of welfare state on. Uh, African women, on one hand, the necessity to try to reduce the stark con- stark contradictions in capitalism, but at the same time, it has issues as far as uh, again, like a bit of, like surveillance. Like, oh, 
are you making this enough money to stay on welfare? Are you are you taking care of your child? If not, oh, the state will, will take your child away or you take your children away. If you have too many children, then there's something up with you. We got to do something. And, and then that gets sort of ignored and 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 then it gets uh and, it, and if you hear uh, any discussion about uh, the birth rate of colonized people, that uh, it's again a bit of policing surveillance that if they have more more and more children, that's a threat to us. So we got something about it. And, it, and it, we we're going back to uh, uh, Ro- uh, Matt, the role of field that one, one funny enough uh, one of the manufacturers of one of the vaccines for COVID, Pfizer, they were behind uh, a multiple deaths and uh, injuries in Nigeria, like, um, I think it's the uh, mid nineties. And again, it, again, this is, uh, and in a lot of cases that, a lot of cases medicine, like not only for finding medicine, but also for uh, like first trials for medicine. If they are in humans, they uh, at times they you either get the sort of scraps for like the for colonized people, or or, or even like here, here you still have like um, and then there's the issue of Deepo Deepo, Deepo Provera, and that's um, in case like, if you if you think it's just oh it's just it just happened to women and it's just what happened to women out there in in the third world they like all oh, they're they're suffering against their men. Uh, they, and then they talk about uh, like the sort of the savage, the savage African male, or or Arab male, or the machismo, or the uh, uh, the dominating the Asian male, uh, uh, acting as if the European male had nothing to do with it. And then, but they still have the colonization uh, exacerbates uh, only exacerbates any patriarchal relations that were already there, and. And and it, and and then even going back to enslavement, that um, that a lot of uh, labor makes it seem like uh, European women were, for the most part, just passively, uh, passively like, oh, oh, we can't. Oh, I wish you could do something about uh, these these Africans. Oh, but they do our our plantation owners. They they hurt us because. Uh, and we can't get reading, we can't get educated, and but then you, know, you find out, oh, many of the European women own slaves too. So <laughs> we're part of that economy, and and again, that, that that sort of thing does not get talked much about in in this uh, capitalist European fem- feminism. That it, it just simply making it so that women are are simply part of the. Uh, part of the quote unquote like public economy or the public po- politics that that in itself is enough uh, under it really ignores the role of colonization imperialism and so on yes indeed it makes me think of the Moynihan report which in my mind comes up a lot it's still people use it unconsciously as a guide, a guide to police African women, because, well, it's women needing to, based on these economic conditions, having to leave the home and their families. And so the family's falling apart, but it's not, it's talking about the symptoms, but it's not talking about the actual problem. And it's not even necessarily talking about a cure. Having read that thing, I'm like, okay, so what's your solution? It's, no, you're just reporting on it, but you're saying or you get the okay. whole or you get the whole bit about oh it's making it's making African women defeminizing the men. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so so many African men in particular fall for this trap, not understand the history of Daniel Patrick Moynihan, first of all, and his children. <laughs> um, but just People who reiterate these points, I don't think even read the report. They're subconsciously reiterating these points, giving in to misogyny more. So as you're saying, you know, men are being effeminized because women have to be the men and have to wear the pants and, you know, they're not staying in and taking care of the kids. And it's like, okay. So 
This also makes me think about Shaharazad Ali's book, Black Man's Guide to Understanding the Black Woman. So she is essentially saying the same thing. She's saying, yes, the problems that African people face, yes, it is caused 50% by men and 50% by women, but women don't acknowledge they're part of the problem. And what women need to do is just let their men take the lead. And if they don't let the men take the lead and they act up, this is what men need to do. It's like, excuse me? <laughs> so she's saying, well, the majority of men that I know support this book, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have people like Jesse Lee, Pe I guess Jesse Lee Peterson, people found out about that guy and now there's a ton of memes about him or something now. I oh, guess gosh. he's a popular <laughs> meme guy. I'm like, wow, I, I, that's kind of entertaining. I mean, I, I find that guy funny because he's also dangerous, but at the same time, it's like, uh, I do laugh at it, but I understand how dangerous it is. That's, that's my contradiction. But people like Jesse Lee Peterson have created organizations for years. People don't know that, but he created a men-based organization to challenge women on this. So you need to know your place. He's always been that way. And so the program that he has in this day and age is focusing on what the correct masculinity is. And so to me, that's funny because it's absurd. But again, it's dangerous because men listen to that and they feel like this is the correct understanding. And with that, women end up being policed. Women in non-men's bodies are policed constantly through vehicles like Jesse Lee Peterson's program. And people continue to reach the Harazad Ali's books to this day and praising it. So if women do not behave and they challenge men, they need a smack in the mouth. Like this is, this is in her book. And so she, so she also has contradicted herself by saying, you know, we need to stop talking about the, the issue of white people. That's not the problem. Black women is the problem because they don't understand they're contributing to the problem and we need to fix that. It's just, I think if people want to challenge ideas like that in books, they need to read those books, not just challenge it because they disagree with it. Because you need to understand what people are saying in order to challenge it. So don't like, I think the issue we have in this day and age with the, the microwave instant gratification, I don't wanna say gener gen generation, but era that we live in, uh, people see something on social media. Yeah, I disagree with that and arguing back and forth, but they're not reading the source material. And for us as organizers, for us in the AAPRP, Reading the source material is of utmost importance. And we have to read the source material of things we disagree with because how are we going to know that we disagree with it? Yeah, so, the enemy. enemy. <laughs> exactly. You got to know what the enemy is doing to know it's the enemy. <laughs> so, I think that anyone who hasn't read that book, I'm sure it's online somewhere. People are still purchasing it though. I'm sure you can find text of it online. I was around, I was a teenager when that book came out. It was 1990. And I remember being in New York. I mean, you're from New York, you live here. So I'm sure on some level, you have heard people talking about this book. And I remember the controversy around it. I remember women coming out and saying, no, my partner read this book and now I'm being abused. Uh, I remember all of this happening at that time. And I was already uh, someone who had a burgeoning anti-patriarchy analysis. Mm -hmm. So then this comes out, I'm like, ooh, wow. So that made me even stronger of a, if you want to call it <laughs> feminist or whatever, that really made my anti-patriarchy stronger. But it did disappoint me at the time as a teenager to see that women were supporting this because I didn't necessarily have the concept of internalized patriarchy. Even though internalized patriarchy was in my family, I didn't have a concept of what it was. I didn't have a name for it. But to see that in action 
through people like Shaharazad Ali, I was just like, wait, why would any woman support a man doing that? You know? So, but now again, like reading more of that material and understanding um, this system of hierarchy, which is promoted under capitalism, I understand it more. And then to add that to capitalist feminism, which says still that women need to be in particular roles in order for society to progress in the way that it needs to. It's like, oh, now I get it. It really does go together. And for Shahara Shahara Ali to be like, well, I'm not talking about white people. I'm talking about us. And but essentially you are talking about a society which is dictated by white supremacy. And as a colonized person, you are still espousing those ideas. And that is what we need to get to. So it's not a matter of what women and men need to do. It's that understanding that we are colonized people and we need to decolonize ourselves. So in order to have that process of the colonization, we do need to read this material to understand that colonization is a reality. So how can we counter that? So then we have a political education process to counter that. But what's happening is that colonized people, people who are feeling oppressed, people who are feeling left out of capitalist society, they're like, man, how can I, you know, not necessarily assimilate, but get along in this society that benefits me. And so this book comes out, and like, yeah, this is what I've been looking for the whole time. And then you have people like Killer Mike or, or T.I. or people on some level who think you can tweak capitalism. I think, uh, was it Bank of America or one of those banks uh, gave uh, Killer Mike a whole bunch of money to start a foundation or a bank or something. So again, how are we going to be autonomous? People talk about autonomy all the time, but how are we going to be liberated if we feel like we have to participate in capitalist society. It, 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 none of that makes sense. And how can we participate in our liberation if we're going to continue accepting colonization? Right. And, and I'm going to go a bit about uh, autonomy is, um, as, as I mentioned when we were talking about earlier with uh, Bay Shabazz and, and one ancestor we also think about what we're also thinking about honor was uh, Rosa Parks and how in, in both cases there was a bit is a bit of policing and so as far as how people view them how their their role within movement and uh, and we'll more about uh, Rosa Parks is uh like, they, like in a way she's played it's, it, or her, her she's been put in both roles as both as a police Policing African women as as far as putting her in the front for the um, Montgomery bus boycott uh, instead of other women like most notably Claudette Colvin. Yes, yep. Rosa Parks was a lighter skin, lighter skin woman. She had uh, more of a professional class uh, bourgeois background and had experience versus a a dark skin a young girl, a young girl who was uh, had. Was having was pregnant, I believe, or yeah, yeah. and 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 then, and that sort of police like we can't like we can't have this other woman, a uh, young girl, be the, the forefront because then that'll make us look bad, and and then and also Rosa Parks herself, like she like there's a police of her legacy too because it because people make it seem like like the only thing she did was like basically sit down. And then we saw the whole civil rights movement <laughs> without without understanding like not only the work she did before a fight of for women who were actually uh, assaulted and raped um, previously, and I think she did work with the, the Scottsboro Boys, and then even after and then afterwards, like she worked um like again for, like for the anti-apartheid movement and. And there's all the work with other like black African liberation works, and so and that gets left out, and, and there's again like a policing of her of legacy, like the African women 
if they are remember something, they get put put in this place. And and we see it's like uh, Af African women gen generally, but the like African women particularly they get put in these places. And and you especially see this with either with the, the wives, the daughters, and mothers of African male revolutionaries that they they get relegated to. Oh, they're just helping them, or they just follow in the footsteps of this and um on one per on one person in particular that uh, I'll, I'll say like i did like a paper on on her for uh, for a class that i'm doing right now uh, that I did this past semester amy jack garvey uh as she was a very like she gets like if you it, like you might not even heard of amy jack garvey for one <laughs> uh and i do like this idea of, of Marcus Garvey and UNA that uh, even in that case, there's, there's even an argument about whether Marcus himself founded the, the Universal Negro Improvement Association or if it was co-founded with Marcus and his first wife, Amy Ashwood Garvey. So again, like that, like they get, they you know, they get left out of uh, discussions of these movements that again, like we, and, and if you read for Amy Jack Garvey, uh, she was behind the. Uh, she was the editor for the uh, "Our Women and What They Think" uh, editorial in the Negro World uh, newspaper, and and a lot of it, it it, come, it sort of stems from uh, the 1922 UNA convention where women in the women in the organization were were calling for autonomy for themselves to be put to be put in leadership positions, and again and again like. And again, it gets dismissed in a lot of organizations now, like the UNA, Black Panther Party, uh, like various like African liberation movements, and so on, and and like our for access to uh, Elma Francois, that a, that a lot of women were a part of these movements, and there are a lot of autonomous African organizations with women and not men who uh, who did this work, and that gets left out, and yeah, and Amy Jack Garvey. They, they they have editorials um, like there's like a longer discussion about the, the sort of like dual nature of the patriarch as far as the patriarchy within uh, the uh, African nationalist uh, movement and as far as like re either replicating other uh, liberation movements at the time and stuff like but it, even there like like the UNA and like black national movements in general and UNA in particular it gets Thought of so so thought gets thought of so much as like uh, the br the brothers like hey we're strong African male men we're leading this movement we got this large movement that's sort of like it's African men. and yeah like, like a lot of Amy Jack Garvey's work is like like does it does exalt uh, Marcus Garvey for helping to lead this organization like like that's that's not make a mistake but at the same time it it's also underscored that. Her part as, as for writing this paper for her further like Pan African work later on, like it, that gets ignored. And you see this with uh, Winnie Mandela, you see it with Rose King, you see it with uh, like so many other women, that, and not, not just those groups, but also the organization and one of the women, um, uh, Udemu, like, like all this is released in. And, it, and even like when we were talking about uh, queens earlier, like like we don't, like we don't like, like the or sort of the like irony is they like talk about oh we're kings and queens, but okay if we're all kings and queens, then uh, who the hell could we, were we leading? And again, there were queens who who did fight against the like, the colonial aspect, like Nina Jinga, Johannes uh, uh, Antewa, like Aminaita, and so on, and so forth. So again, like. A police like the police in place in multiple ways in, our, in our, as far as talking about who which women get discussed how they're discussed and so on. and and they, they even talk about um uh, Mar uh, marsha b johnson like they, they like she was um that like, they, they talk about oh uh, she wanted to throw the brick and then it, but then that ignores uh stormy devarney like ignores her role and then Marsha B. Johnson, along with Sylvia Rivera, they were they were they led Star, they, so they were doing they were organizing themselves. So again, it, even when 
and people who have marginalized standards while or not the like, heteronormative of Africans are are lifted up. They like their legacy gets reduced or exaggerated in some way that ignores the fact that hey, they did a lot organizing work themselves. So. Yes, you said a mouthful, and I want to get to some of those points. First of all, uh, Marsha P. Johnson or Marsha Pay It No Mind Johnson. <laughs> I think people would uh, say she was non binary after, like, if you want to talk about sort of more modern language, which is pay it no mind. It's like, pay no mind what my gender is, what is the work I'm doing? And I think that was really important. And the, the argument over who threw the first brick. Marsha Pre Johnson may not have thrown the first brick. She did throw a brick though. And it was to smash the cop car. <laughs> it's like, all right, what's up? And as you were saying, like, to continue what you're saying rather, um, a lot of people don't understand the relationship between state sanctioned violence against LGBTQ plus folks. And so when you're seeing more and more uh, organizing groups saying, we don't want cops at our pride, this is what a lot of this stems from. There's a history as to why it's not just George Floyd, it's not just what's recently happening. There's a history behind police violence of LGBTQ folks. And then there was the lavender scare and under Joseph McCarthy. So there were serious repercussions for being someone who was not cis and hetero. And so a lot of what's happening today is based on that history. And more and more people are learning about that history and responding in kind. So I wanted to say that because uh, Marsha P. Jo oh, I wish I could have met Marsha P. Johnson and I wish I could have met Sylvia Nevada and I wish I could have met all of the elders who were fighting against police violence at that time. And I actually was alive uh, when both of them were alive. I just never met them. And, um, and to the point about Rosa Parks. So what happened with that was uh, Raymond Parks <laughs> So he actually was doing a lot of organizing around the Scottsboro Boys issue and, sh and they met at that time. So she said, oh, I'm gonna get on that too. And then she continued her life of organizing and activism. And so I thought of that, not, because, not only because of the Rosa Parks part, but because of the Winnie Mandela part, because people don't even understand that she continued her organizing and activism. It wasn't that she was, behind Nelson Mandela and said, okay, he's president now, I'm gonna stop that work. She was just like, we do not allow traitors here. Like I am for the liberation of my people, African people, and I am going to take that with me until I leave this earth. The work that she was hardcore about it. And Mama uh, Zandeni Sabukwe, a lot of people don't understand the work that she did in, the process of liberating the people of Azania, uh, occupied Azania. Um, so I just, when you were saying all that, I was thinking uh, there, there, there's so many stories that could be told of these women and non-men who stood on the front lines of this work. And so when people, people even in organizing spaces try to police that, like what we were talking about in the other episode with like, why should dark skin African women be on the front lines of these men being killed? And then you're policing, whether or not you know it, you're policing women and non-men's bodies. We are already on the front lines and we have to understand that the state is murdering all of us. And for us to separate that, we have to struggle amongst ourselves with the issues of misogynoir, of patriarchy happening in our families in our organizations, in our communities. But to say, I'm not gonna even support the mothers of these children that we should be struggling with, to not support the sisters of these brothers that we should be struggling with because you don't support the brothers. Again, we are a disorganized people. So 
when we publicly say things like that, you don't think that capitalism is taking that in and going, yeah, let's let's further fuel African death and let's have them fight. And you know, you don't think that that's happening. But I am an optimist as an organizer in this organization. I know that through this process of political education, there is a point of liberation that's going to happen. But if folks continue to resist that political education based on their limited notion of what, li what liberation is and how we will or won't get there, yeah, okay, in your mind, we're not going to get there, but I know we will get there because as a mass of the people, we have to have this understanding. So uh, to have these little fights, these public fights, or I'm not going to, um, you know, whatever, men don't fight for me, so I'm not going to fight for men. It, best you believe capitalism's watching. <laughs> and, and I think there's a... Uh... And there's another aspect as far as uh, the policing of uh, Afro is, and, um, and we had as we had our early episode about is, uh, the role of religion, and that as a place of a, a huge role in not only among like with, within the the, uh, the colonization of Africans and using and using religion as an excuse to say uh, women have I'd like you talk about with Jesse Peter Peterson that he, he bases it on like very like a, a really reactionary uh interpretation of the bible that using it and, and i think in some I think in many cases that that is that, that's based upon the like the, they have these ideas whether it's from christianity or islam or or whatever or whatever like that they they just use this just excuse to uh to police african women police their relationship police their bodies police what, what what work they're doing so on and they use it as, on a basis of and use that as a basis to police them and like basically keep, keep them in the place and not only for like, within like movements or or, or, or or collectives but also like the like the like, even if you don't think it think of this way for like the uh, there's the U.S. Empire, European, or like the Eastern Empire, like Japan, like J Japan, like they they, they use like religion or uh, to uh, to justify like the, to justify the 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 whole theft and exploitation of the people, the land, the labor, and these and these go together, and that's and for, and that's one reason that for the like, the APRP we talk, we we express that there is. That there can be a harmony between religion and revolution. That if your religion is if the religion that either from your own discovery or from or that was imposed upon you, if that if if that religion is getting in the way of liberating people, you either you either have to discard it or you have to use it in a way that does further that. Uh, it does further the, the liberation struggle. Like, yeah, you, you you just have to keep it keep that in mind. That um, I know the discussion of religion that uh, some people think like, oh, we can't like we can't be Christian, we can't be Muslim, we have to all return to our uh, like African traditional religions. And and in the and it might and in the long term that might be the case. And it, we're not as and we're not opposed we're not opposed to. Of uh, that point is just saying that uh, that religion in itself is it, it it's connected to the the resources. It's connected to education. It's connected that it's not something that oh, if we just go back to if we just all practice Europe uh, Ifa or we all practice the Congo or all practice uh, uh, Kemet or something like that, like that in itself won't that. I, it might be, I, it might be a necessary thing, but it's not in itself sufficient. That's all so to say that we just and, and and if you think just become an atheist, uh, have you seen some of the atheist discussion about women, especially African women? So again, you have you have to understand it is understanding of these contradictions with regards to religi religiosity or irreligiosity and understanding how that's. Uh, at that point, uh, 
it, if it any way uh, prevents that collective work, that egalitarian work, then yeah, you might discard it. Or if it, or if you do feel that it's important, you have to, like there, there are, there have been uh, of groups like, like if you're like liberation theology, there's been uh, of like of like radical. I was like, I talk about uh, Bay Shabazz, El, El Shabazz, um, the use of, of of Islam for and using it as within the Pan African struggle, uh, liberation theology, the among the things that again, and of course there are Africans who use like the like the indigenous religions to for their struggle, like the Mount the Mount Mount big time and. Or we talk about Haiti and use of uh, voodoo, voodoo. So again, again, you have, it's just understanding these contradictions and figure out how how to do so in a way that frees us and particularly doesn't do so in the way that polices African women. You know what I mean? Yes, you even have Pan Africanists, anti-imperialists, such as. Thomas Sankara, who talked about a revolution not being successful without the emancipation of women. You have Oliver Tambo, who is in the ANC, who talked about, uh, you know, the, the woman's place is not in the kitchen, but it is in the front lines of the struggle. So there's already a historical basis on why women and non-men's bodies shouldn't be policed because we need everybody out here doing that work and struggling with each other in order to get to that place of liberation. It makes no sense that a certain group of people would be down here and then, okay, we got our liberation. This is why we're Pan-Africanists. We can't be over here fighting for the struggle in the US against getting murdered by the state while people in Haiti are, are fighting against US imperialism right now. What, that doesn't make any kind of sense. <laughs> like Africans in Colombia are yeah, dealing. Yeah. Like it makes no sense when if we're fighting when the very policies of the country we live in are the cause of the ruination of the economies of other places around the world where Africans live. Like just the destabilization, economic and otherwise political, etc., of Libya. Like how can we? talk about our liberation and even be like, we built this country, not understanding the connection to the oppression of other Africans around the world and the oppression and policing of women here. How can we talk about uh, just having a struggle and overcoming a struggle and we shall overcome and we're gonna win without having that historical basis and that historical political, economic, gender and land analysis. How can we, achieve anything without having any of those to be connected. So we have to ask ourselves those questions when it comes to the issue of the policing of women and non-men's bodies. And we've named various examples here. <laughs> so I do wanna ask you about the dialectics because I, I know you did want to address this on some point, the dialectics around the desexualization of African women and the hypersexualization of African women. Oh, uh, the thing to die like is uh, we mentioned at, at, at points in time that the uh, that when African women are seen as and it, it, and it, it kind of applies in both in both uh, when African women are desexualized as well as uh, hypersexualized that for one it is deemed as if those those African women. Like they, we, we can do whatever we want. Like if they're sexualized, then oh, they're not really women. That so they don't have, don't deserve the women, the quote unquote right uh, um, is, uh, aspects of womanhood. So therefore, we can make them work. We can make it work for us. We can make them do that. We could, we can force them to do whatever, and then, you don't know, have the care of them. And on the flip side, hypersexuality, like, again, like the discussion of, of anyone, like, any African woman who has, who either from, mainly from like, like, like uh, economic exploitation or 
or some other like or physical exploitation or, or mental exploitation that like, if even if in that case like they like if in that case you have sexualizing the fact that oh they they were somehow like like it, it, I, I hear this from my family quite a bit the whole, like oh like so like someone like a, a young girl or like a cousin or a friend of a cousin so like they if they they show affection or or like there's like a, like attraction to someone they call them fast like oh there's a fast girls or and and in that way and then if something happens and like if they get harassed in the street or at work or a family then oh they must have done something and again it's it, it, it eliminates any kind of nuance for African women that it, you can do you do either one and and therefore you can you can just take either like either role and then you just and you can use that to dismiss dismiss their work to dismiss their troubles to dismiss it and think of it as oh they they, they need to they need to just work 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 and if they have they say like oh I need some time like no, you, like oh no, you can't do this. And then, or if they say, oh, I, I enjoy, I enjoy my body, I enjoy like, like the healthy sexual like, relations or something, or something that's beyond the smoke of the, the vanilla. And it's like, oh, you just, oh, you're just, you're just one of those loose women. Oh, you're just trying to, oh, you're trying to milk my money or something like that. And, and again, it. And again, it, and I, I guess, I guess, and this ties again with like we we speak so much about the land issue is like, uh, tied to the land that uh, we that and, and you see this in like for any like colonized folk that the land is the land like the connected to the women is like we could use the land for however we want we could we could do monoculture we could grow this to exploit it as much as we can without like oh. Oh, we can't grow it there. Oh, we just go over there. Or, oh, why is it not growing? Like, we, or we just have to use some more pesticides, or we gotta do, or we gotta do some Monsanto seeds or Cargill seeds or something like that, <laughs> and uh, like just use it however we want. And, and if or if someone tries to use it in a way where like actually like like working with like it's like like we talk about like build like you hear this use and sometimes misuse like the whole listen to black women or listen to African women like, in a way it's like listen to the land listen to the to the new age and and colonization involves like oh I don't care about listening I don't care about like taking time to taking time to understand some of the, the positive and negatives I just want I just want more and more and more and more and more for to increase my wealth to increase are the power and and and, and this is a place for women that African women that uh, it doesn't matter like if we if they care about the humanity of woman it's either either use use you to work either doing manual labor or domestic labor or sexual labor it, it all all the masses that you're working for me or you're working for all these people and again that's how it's tied up. Yeah, they call Africa Mama Africa. Mama Africa's crying. Look what we're doing to her. Continues to get exploited. Or even how they name countries she. So countries land tends to have a feminine or she or a, a pronoun attributed to a woman or a non-male. And except for Germany, that was the fatherland, which is just <laughs> but most other countries are she and um, we pledge allegiance to her or so you can pledge allegiance to her, but you do not treat her well. You do not treat her with respect. And see, when you're saying stuff, I'm thinking of all these other things. Um, and this is getting back to uh, the colorism that exists in varying industries. So I saw this movie I was watching with my aunt and it had the guy from Black Panther. Uh, I think it was the guy that played Killmonger, I think. No? Michael B. Jordan? Yes, yes. And so he played an agent or a spy and they were fighting against Russia or something. Ah! 
So I was like, anti-Russian propaganda. And there was a sister who was beautiful. And she had short hair. And she was of a darker hue. And she played his assistant. So I said to my aunt, if she was light-skinned, they would have already had a romantic scene. And so usually in these movies, if somebody is of a darker hue, they're usually the helper or they're the sister or they're one of the guys. And with that notion of being desexualized, you see this a lot in movies. And so there is definitely a double standard in how African women are viewed based on their hue and whether or not they get romantic leads, whether or not um, they get leads which are significant to the plot even. If we're going to see liberation of our people, what are some solutions to these issues? Uh, women are usually on the front, non-men, trans folks are usually on the front lines of this struggle. If men are to be seen as participating in the struggle, if men feel like, well, I'm left out, what are some solutions that exist to deal with that so we all work together towards our liberation? I think I think the key thing is is on the one hand allow for the allow for these uh, uh, African women and not men to organize within themselves autonomously that you do you have to allow to, like understand issues that are affecting themselves sort of like like the way that Africans like, it's okay for Africans to like organize within themselves and understand issues that are affecting them as Africans it's okay for for men and not men to organizing issues affecting them particularly at the same time i think any issues of oh where's my place where's my place like they like again we are talking about working side a lot like side by side like together collectively and and uh i understand that one hand you allow for that autonomous organizing but at the same, same time like understanding and and i think this it's like listening and honest and not only listening and also implying that to struggles and having uh transformative uh, forms of accountability to understand like understanding both the role of of like your of your european first uh um uh, balance of european first exploitation of capitalist exploitation of patriarchal exploitation affecting how it affects African women, I mean, it's particular, and even and even if you see some works like um, uh, J. Curry, like the Dr. J. Curry, that patriarchy in a way like affects African men in some ways as well. Obviously, it were obviously in a different manner, but still it affects us. And and uh, and even if you understand that, understand that it affects African women too, uh, and not men too, and that. There is opportunities to understand and correct behavior to undergo that political transformation to build structures that allow for this uh, opportunity for them to build. Yes, and as you said, that women and non-men do need those spaces as well. Um, men need those spaces of study of having political education to understand the mechanisms of patriarchy and how they are affected by it and how they benefit from it and how the relationships with women could be dictated by patriarchy. It's important to begin to resolve these issues through a period of work study, which is continual. It does not stop. Education doesn't stop after you get out of a certain grade. Education is a lifetime. And conditions, material conditions shift. The system's still the same, but the system also shifts in accordance to whatever needs people have. So we're organizing until everyone has their needs met, but capitalism's working stronger to make sure that's not happening. So the conditions are still shifting. So you must have a lifelong constant state of political education to recognize these conditions and how particular people benefit under these conditions and how particular people 
uh, are affected by these conditions. So I think everyone having that space of study is really, really crucial. <laughs> Not only that, understand like a different, uh, different of revolution, African people and different cultures of African people Understand, like, understand that history that it 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 didn't it is not like it's not some uh, Steve Harvey or Jesse Peterson fantasy it has been that most part and understand that that you know, like African cultures differed it's like some some were more communal some had some more hierarchy and and, and even and within like liber liberatory movements some some were able to put the question of what African women, what their roles, some put that up front and dealt with it more up front. Some said left that to the after the revolution, and you understand that the, it, the conditions differ in some way. Some some felt better than others, and understand that you understand. And once you understand the history, you try to learn what did they do well, what could they improve, and then apply it to your work. And I think that's a big big point. That and, and like you're saying, there's no no point where he's reads really like, oh yeah, I'm 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 egalitarian man. I like we're all good or something, but it's always you always you just keep learning that even if you think you got it all, you just always something. Well that's the thing too, because when the Panthers have the chant the revolution has come, people think that the revolution is somewhere off in the field somewhere and we have to wait for it. The revolution is happening. And Gil Scott Heron was right when he said the revolution will not be televised. It's happening as people are organizing. It's happening in parts of the world that you're not paying attention to. That doesn't mean it's not happening. And after the revolution, that would mean we would have globally achieved communism. That's just my fear. <laughs> That's when the revolution will have been completed and everyone's just like, okay, great. But it's going to continue forever until that happens. And even if we reach that point, as you're saying, things could still happen. There could be patriarchy still. There could still be assaults. There could still be all these things. If we don't have that process of political education, we're not going to reach that point, even if it's like, yay, communism. So it is so crucial to have this lifelong education. And even when we've reached it, just so we stay there continue to have that political education because you know what there's going to be new generations coming up and somebody's going to try to destabilize that because capitalism is going to be like it's going to take a long time but capitalism is going to try to to inch his way in there so we got to be like nope bam so continue that process of political education continue that process even if you are living a life of comfort just because you are doesn't mean someone else is. So we have to continue that this process and continue organizing until we know and we understand that every single person on this earth is liberated. And for us, Africa's primary, because we know that is the primary resource of all of this. Everything that we do, this, this podcast, the, the things that we do, the technology, so much of what we do is based on what's happening in Africa is based on those resources. So if we don't liberate ourselves and those resources, we're not getting anywhere. So we, we understand that Africa's primary to us, but we understand that there's also fights for land elsewhere. And we support that. And we also know that there's fights against patriarchy around the world, and we support that. So having that consistent process of political education is crucial. I don't know how many times we could repeat that, but it's gonna keep getting repeated just like we say pretty much every week to organize your own organization. And it makes me happy to see folks say, yeah, I joined AAPRP, I joined this organization, I joined that organization. As long as you're in an organization with this understanding that liberation is the objective, we support you. But uh, having a gender analysis, an anti-patriarchal analysis, understanding that the policing of African women, the policing of non-men, the policing of marginalized genders, et cetera, must cease 
that is that also needs a political education process not just about land not just about oh african people it, it, understand that we're all here if we have this understanding land is she and this we have to understand there's also people who also are she who are they who you know again other marginalized genders that also are part of this liberatory process or also part of this organizing so once we have that understanding we're good to go and let's continue this until we are all liberated all right so that's it for our Sua podcast. Uh, as we as we tell you, uh, if you can't find an organization that is struggling for the liberation of African people, if you find or if you're in one and you make it always, you can always find another one. You can always find make your own. Uh, all, again, check out if you're interested in joining the AAPRP. Let's check out the website and also. Uh, find other uh, brother sister organizations and ally organization and also keep keep listening to other podcasts we got our comrades out in uh, so-called new mexico occupied new mexico uh, new mexico so-called uh, they do their things on thursday on thursday afternoon uh, have our uh, brother jama and his daughter shakura they do their sunday podcast also uh Revolution African Women's podcast, as well as of, or is it the social media team podcast out in the West Coast as well. So check those out and keep keep up, and we'll see you next week, Monday. Yes, yes, yes. Forward ever, backwards never. Forward. <laughs>